There's a pretty one, Ulysses. It's a special delight to welcome the Canadian writer Margaret McPherson to my channel for the first, hopefully not the last time. We are here to discuss her new memoir, Tracking the Caribou Queen, and the um, subtitle is Memoirs of a Settler Girlhood. And Margaret McPherson is a Canadian from the West and the North, but she's joining us today from Deep River, Ontario. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Sean. It's nice to be here. So I didn't know anything about you until I went to your book launch in Saskatoon about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago. And I would like you to introduce yourself to the people watching this video. Okay. Uh, I guess the first thing is clearly I'm a settler, but I grew up in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories in the 60s and 70s. And I had a very rich and uh, beautiful life. I've worked as a newspaper reporter. I've worked abroad a fair bit. My husband and I lived in Bermuda for a while, which was great. And I kind of, you know, I got the typical story that you have to have something to fall back on. So I should go into journalism rather than writing. But my heart was always a creative writer. And even in magazine and newspaper writing, I found myself tending to feature writing and tending to arts writing. And after I had a couple of children I decided to get my MFA and I was it was during the early 90s and I was able to get into the residency at UBC and they only selected eight uh, 14 students per semester and we had to work in all genres and it was a very intense time Eden Robinson was one of my classmates and just you know some people have gone on to be quite have a luminous careers. I can't say the same for myself. I had a third child and I had to put my career on hiatus, but I slowly, slowly after getting the MFA, I, I was always writing, but I, I wasn't publishing a lot. I had a long chapter of my life when I was raising my family and living in Edmonton, Alberta, and often would write short stories or poems because I had small children. My husband was a surveyor and worked in the field. So he wasn't home a lot in those early days with small children and a million things to do. But my, sh my first real book of literary fiction was a short story collection. It came out in 2004. And after that, a novel and then another novel and so I've sort of been building the short story collection, the two novels, always writing poetry. And I had to take a bit of a hiatus. In 2009, a book came out called Body Trade. And I, in that book, I assumed the voice of an Indigenous person, um, not really realizing that I was appropriating a culture and an entire voice. And... That book is a story of two young women traveling from Yellowknife to Central America. I really had to kind of take stock after that book came out because I realized a lot of things were happening. I was going through a lot of changes in my own life. And I just realized that I didn't know, even though I grew up with a lot of Indigenous people, I didn't, it was wrong to, to assume that I really knew anything. And I had to do a lot of soul searching and really rethinking and unlearning a lot of stereotypes that I'd come up with. And so I had a huge hi hiatus in my writing from 2009 until 2022 when Tracking the Caribou Queen came out. And this book is kind of about that hiatus and me doing a lot of personal work around assumptions, around stereotype around my own childhood and some of the prejudices that I had come up with. And I hadn't really examined those before. Something interesting, my father was the uh, superintendent of schools and later the director of education. So my brothers and myself went and my sister went to a school that had a residence attached to it. Now, it wasn't the residential school that you would you would think of, that that many people think of. 
because this was for grade nine, 10, 11, and 12. So it was older students who came down from the high Arctic, from the Mackenzie Delta, and we all went to school together, but the hostel kids were, were separate. They lived separately and were streamed separately and just had a very different life than the town kids. And I was spending time thinking about my childhood and um, the way I was raised and thinking about my father and his job and coming from Yellowknife. And I really had to deconstruct a lot of that and my own writing and think about what I knew and what I didn't know and what I got so terribly wrong. Like, like really a lot of, a lot of us who thought we, you know, knew what we were doing or had, had the answers for Indigenous people and, and really wrongheadedly made some choices on the behalf of others rather than listening. And so Caribou Queen has sprung from this, this journey I've taken into my own reconciliation and trying to understand what that means and trying, trying to really plumb my own depths to understand where my prejudices came from and what I can do about them. That is what the book is about. So it's a marvelous segue into getting to, into talking about the book. It's a beautiful book. It's beautifully written. It makes me, I'm craving reading more of your books because I just fell in love with the prose. Thank and you. Thank you. it's, I remember at the book launch that I attended, you and um, David Carpenter, my former prof and uh, a talented writer in and of himself, we're talking about a genre and I'd, I'd like to hear more about how you ended up writing a memoir because I'm not sure that that's how you started out. Well, this is true because I was, I considered myself a fiction writer. I tried to tell a story about a woman going back to the North, a social worker uh, overcome by guilt, trying to work out her own relation to the land to the people of the territories, the Dene culture. But again, the characters, some of them were indigenous and I was I was making them up. And I just felt how wrong headed that was. I really needed to keep this story kind of in my lane. It had to be all from me. Not that I'm a, an important player at all, but I really wanted to keep the point of view in my voice and in my perspective, because what I'm attempting in this book is to really look at a white person and a child, because I was a child when I went up north and children are just, you know, children just take things at face value. And I think that's one of the beauties about children. I think I was two and a half when I arrived in the Northwest Territories and it was my world. I didn't really know or remember anything else. Children take on what they hear and what they learn. And I mean, it's not, it's not like I didn't take responsibility, but I chose to narrate this book from the very, my very first memories and really look at some of the judgments that I was hearing around me and some of the things that I was taking on as a child. But because the nature of memory is so fickle, I chose that sort of unreliable child voice to narrate to Caribou Queen. And I really wanted to understand, to really look into the tropes that dominated my life, really, because I heard on one hand, I had this idea of sort of the noble savage, a terrible, terrible stereotype, but somehow Indigenous people were close to the land and close to the spirit world. And to me, in part, they were, you know, this, this notion that they knew things I didn't know. And there was this magical community and communion among them, which made me long for that world. But the other thing that was equally damning was this notion of sort of the the rowdy, drunk Indian, you know, and that was very much those two tropes, both of them so entirely wrong headed. And yet I couldn't kind of, I saw them, I saw them both. One was more in my imagination. Uh, the other one was more acted out in street life. And I, I really wanted to try to 
pull those things apart and say, wanted to look at the whole notion of colonization and from a very personal point of view. And I just, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, in 1992, Sean, when my mom passed away, I was rooting around in a, in a shed on our property. And I found this um, silver tea service, a tray, heavy, weighted, a silver tea service that was engraved. It was a, upon it was engraved to N.J. McPherson for his tour to the Eastern Arctic. I think it was 1964 or 65. Uh, Commissioner of the Northwest Territories, a big territorial um, emblem in the center. And it was this heavy sort of tea service. And my mother had wrapped it and kind of put it in a shed and she couldn't give it away to the value village or anything because it was, it had my father's name, you know, engraved on it. And to me, it just, the weight of that tray and the fact that it was, did not jive at all with what I knew of these Arctic settlements with such high suicide rates and such poverty and such despair. And here was this colonial symbol that had been gifted to my father for touring the Arctic, for looking at the schooling and the situation of teachers and schooling and education. And the weight of the tea service in that back shed just really weighed on my heart and really made me really start thinking about what were we doing? What, what was the, what was the mandate for, you know, civilizing or educating and what were the divides in the indigenous population and the town or the kids population and I was a lucky enough to um, to have some friends that were indigenous and to really learn as I grew up to start to see myself more clearly and see the prejudices that I was carrying and certainly the effect of colonization on the people that were my neighbors. It was, I was quite ashamed. I mean, there was a, I had to kind of work through that and try to write truthfully about what I knew and what I saw and what I believed and how that belief changed over time. So, yeah. You do that beautifully, focusing and keeping the point of view very much in your young, much younger self. And I don't like reading fiction with a child narrator much of the time it has to be done really well and so boy you did it really well because I was riveted and it reads like a novel so you were a novelist and you've written a memoir and it's a beautiful reading experience I don't want us to say too much about what's in it because we want people to go out and buy this book and read it three times and then give it to their friends to read right. but I thought a useful way to move through some of it to give viewers a sense of what what's in it editing sean here well just my luck there's a very important word coming up and i don't enunciate it properly or some little glitch in the recording and it's almost impossible to hear the word that i kind of mumble which is a way that i want to focus the conversation for the next few minutes is access so now you know is what i was struck by is Access as being kind of, I don't wouldn't go so far as to say it's a theme of the, your memoir, but it's it's a way in which the themes of your memoir are explored. And I guess the most dramatic one for me is about the woman who freezes to death close to your family home in Yellowknife, and and you imagine you reflecting on that as an adult and as a child. But there was several others where access was granted, where you went to your indigenous friends' homes or they came to your homes or whatever. There was even one, there's a scene in a getting a ride in a truck after a harrowing incident in the cold. And I just wondered if you'd like to tell us about a few of those to give us a sense of, of what your book is all about. The Sophie football piece, you know, when I was thinking I was writing this novel, I went up to Yellowknife and uh, drove the Mackenzie Highway again. And I went to the local cemetery, Lakeview, just because it's a place where I knew a lot of the people. And I, I saw Sophie Football's grave again. I, I was probably 53 or 54 at the time. It was the first death that I encountered where I felt that 
I had some responsibility in that death. Even though I was a child, she froze to death on a Saturday night and on Sunday morning she was found. And I mean, she was, she was close to our house and I couldn't understand how that could happen that how that how somebody could freeze to death in yellow knife so i asked my sister why didn't she knock on our door and the response my sister was five years older than me and the response was well we you know nobody knocks on the door in the middle of the night but that didn't make sense to me if you were freezing to death you would knock on the door so there were certain places the white population generally lived in the the new town it was called the new town and the old town was a little bit forbidden, a little bit mysterious, a little bit inaccessible, unless you were with somebody who lived down there. And it was often really old timers or indigenous peoples who lived in these places called the Woodlot and, uh, you know, Rainbow Valley and um, Willow Flats, certainly enticing but with that edge of danger so or at least a perceived danger as a child so in my experience the populations were kept very separate that incident about traveling in the truck was one of myself and another friend tried to ski to data and really ridiculous like quite naive and incredibly data is a one of the original uh, villages that's probably about six maybe eight kilometers from Yellowknife, but on the opposite shore of the, the arm. And it's a long ski. And we got, we got, well, we were tired, we were ill-prepared. And then one of those curious things that happened was the blue sky just disappeared and we were, we were lost on the lake and it was a whiteout. It was inc incredible to be skiing and not being able to see the shore. And, and the sky was the same color as the snow. And we were rescued by a, a man in a in a kamek and taken into data and basically rescued it saved warmed up and then driven back to yellowknife which was quite a long way around if you didn't cross on the ice you had to go the long way around and cross the yellowknife river about a 45 minute drive but being in that truck and being rescued and that gratitude i felt but I don't want to say too much about what happens in that story, but the idea that people would go the extra mile. And I saw that time and time again in my lifetime is Indigenous people really, I don't want to generalize, but in personal experiences, people who were generous and people who were willing to share what they had. And here my family sat, or many of the family sat with a lot and there wasn't that same generosity of spirit like why was our door closed and I mean it wasn't always closed I don't want to diss my family at all they were wonderful wonderful people but I really saw the discrepancy between the kids who were hostel kids or hall kids and town kids and just the way the streaming of the education was all the indigenous kids were expected to go into the vocational stream and you know they might be truck drivers or housekeepers or possibly secretaries but a lot of the white kids were streamed to go on to university and you know those things just kept on as I started remembering my childhood I started really pondering what was behind that and and how did I absorb that to make it okay like how did that be okay in my in my child's heart and you know it's not just a child narrator because a child grows into a teenager grows into a young adult Definitely. and I wanted to show in my the first you know 17 years of my life how that attitude evolved oh this is just these these people are different these are other the people the notion of the other you pick that up if it's if it's the attitude of the town it's something that's that's picked up and that's one of the things that i will say is a lot of people have read this memoir and they it's not their experience they didn't grow up in the northwest territories or they didn't grow up in yellow Knife. 
but they certainly have seen this book as a reflection of their own lives as opposed to my life, but just so that the book has become a mirror to them and growing up in the 60s and 70s, these attitudes are really what we need to examine if we're going to go forward in a new way and really accept all our relations. I wholeheartedly agree with you yeah. that, and you do that so well. Before we, because that's a great segue, but I'm not quite ready to segue yet to that, but that's how I'd, where I'd like to go next. This is also just a beautiful coming of age memoir. I mean, part of what the coming of age is about is real is realizing all these things you've just been talking about. But a lot of it, too, is just about a wonderful young girl becoming moving towards ad- adulthood. And one of the most beautiful parts of it was the relationship with Lawrence. And we don't want to say too much, but I'd like you to tease the viewers a little bit about that, because that was so beautiful. Oh, my God. Oh, gosh. Every time I have an opportunity to read this book for people. I ask if Lawrence is in the crowd. I have never been able to find him. Yeah, we were just from different worlds and he taught me a lot and I had a crush. I had a girlhood crush. It really never developed into anything, but in my mind, it was fairly, you know, it was a relationship in my, in my romantic mind, but it was really just being with people who had a relationship to the land. And I also had a relationship to the land because because I grew up there, the land really was my teacher and I knew it really well. There was very little to do except we didn't have television until 1972, just wandering around, what wandering around the landscape. There wasn't really anywhere to go except the little town, you know? And so I knew the land really well and I did have a relationship with it but I didn't understand the indigenous relationship with the land and not that it's so different but it was it it, it's so integral and it's so ingrained whereas I felt like I was on the land Uh, Lawrence taught me that the land was was him like it was part of him like he knew things that I didn't know he knew the names of the trees and he knew um, indigenous names and he knew stories and they weren't my stories. They weren't my United church stories. You know, they were different. It was a very important relationship as was Marianne and Carmel. Like, very, very much so. Yes. There's a lot yeah. of um, important relationships and a lot of those larger issues. Again, you explore it right down at that micro level, which is why yeah. I love the, one of the reasons why I love the book so much. I don't want to leave the reader's, uh, mistakenly thinking that the Lawrence story is just about what you've said, because it's also much about your kind of awakening to your own sexuality and just like you say, having a crush and, and how some of those stereotypes you were able to kind of played into that. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they played into it, but that you were also at a certain point, even if it's only in retrospect, while you were writing it kind of bat that away to, to appreciate in a, in a much in a uh, complete uh, devoid of those stereotypes, uh, appreciate what his perspective. Yeah, it was just yeah, there was a purity there, kind of a beautiful purity there. I mean, uh, that's such a weird word to use, but because we weren't in a sexual relationship at all, right. and right. I mean, I probably wanted one, but it's my parents left when I was in grade eleven, so I had a yes. lot of freedom. You I had did. a lot of freedom. Yeah, I did, but I was also really trying to figure out that I was quite lonely. I'd been in a family of seven, seven people. And suddenly I was by myself, I was boarded. And um, I was really trying to, to, to balance a lot of those things, but to be alone in the territories at that quite young age, I think it's my mother's largest regret is leaving me in the territories, but it was my decision and I wanted to stay. I wanted to do grade 12 there. I certainly didn't want to do grade 13 in Ottawa. Just getting back to that that girl. I mean, the book isn't really about residential schools. It's not really about Indigenous relations. It's really about girlhood. Because there was a lot of there was a lot of fast money up there. Giant mine was roaring, an undercurrent of violence and drink and fast money and transient people and you know it was a very strange place to grow up I was kept quite safe and I was quite 
naive in many ways. I would add to that list of all those unsavory or if not outright dangerous things. Uh, you have some really vivid descriptions of some really creepy scenarios with about sexual predators or or at least people that seemed like that's what they were. We're not sure. Or you didn't tell us the, the rest of the story, but it was enough to was like, oh, creepy, creepy, some creepy yeah, men up there. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that, I mean, a lot of people hid in the North. A lot of people, and let's be fair, if you had something in the South or somewhere else, you could get a job in the North much more easily. I had some very unusual teachers and I, some of them were wonderful and some were not so wonderful. So now I'd like to come back to what you've um, already mentioned. One of the things you intended for this book was that for the reader, for the settler Canadian reader, I think the settler reader of any country, as a mirror. So please, yeah. please riff on that for a while. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. I think we have come... I've been reading a lot of narratives by Indigenous writers, and they're they're heartbreaking... And they really opened my eyes. But I, I felt like I needed to respond. I felt like there needed to be a response of, of some stripe to this, to this trauma to, that was perpetrated basically by my generation and the generation before mine. And I just really felt that the only thing I'm, I can do is I can write. And Tracking the Caribou Queen is a response to reading about the devastation of the residential schools, about the devastation on families, the ripping apart of uh, culture. And like, where do I sit in that? What is my responsibility? What does it mean to, to be part of the culture, the white culture that was dominant, that dominated, that laid down all the ground, that took the land, that set up the schooling system. What does it mean to be part of that? Well, I guess this is the thing I, I felt the best thing for me was to lay down my own life and just take a look at my own life, particularly when I was um, in the territories and, and try to parse out where my attitudes came from and from whom they came and how did I embody those attitudes? It is my story, but it could be anybody's story. And I've had a lot of response from readers, Sean, that have said to me, I remember being afraid. I remember of othering people. I remember sort of not really, like not really recognizing what we know now because we're, we're so much more informed and I'm so grateful for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and for the the steps that are we're moving ahead. We're finally starting to listen to Indigenous voices. We're starting to hear these stories. We're starting to respond to these stories. I am so grateful for the for that. But in the sixties and seventies, it was almost like zero awareness, like zero awareness. Oh, this is this is what's going on. I guess this is the way it should be that we would consider ourselves somehow superior beings or, well, the white way is the right way. Well, not necessarily. And we've really bungled things. So the more I learn about it, the more I realize it is time that we listen to Indigenous people and we listen to their teaching. But before we can do that, there is this act, I think, of self-examination. And my book is Self-Examination. And it was my method I guess the only way I knew how to do this was to write down memories and then to craft them into story to craft these vignettes that are all real and all based on my life into story that illustrates the the prejudices that I held and that I was not aware of I didn't even know the school was a residential school I just knew that there were a lot of Inuit kids there and there were a lot of Dene kids there but near the twain should meet. I mean, in theory, we used to sing this song, Indian, Eskimo, and white. We are all of one delight. And and yet we were so separate. Like we were so separate. So I wanted to look to sort of tease those things apart and really, really look at them and and see how it 
became so fractured and what we can do moving forward. That's really important. And I think I end the book on something called community. And I've really recognized that it is in community that we, we get to, we can really move forward in a new way. Well, as, as one reader, um, it certainly invited me because it's so personal. There's so, somehow you've created a space in the reading of it for the reader to also be kind of in dialogue with themselves about uh, what they can relate to. And I related to so much growing up in small town Saskatchewan, growing up on a farm in the 70s and 80s. Right. And uh, right. just a, a lot of, uh, and my mom, who was a um, generation older than you, and she had her own memory. She just uh, recently read it and loved it as well. So it is a book that it's a kind of an act of participation read. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Um, one of the biggest compliments I got was from an Indigenous woman. And she said to me, this book was very carefully vetted, by the way. There was a lot of, I had an Indigenous editor. I had a lot of sensitivity readers. It was, there was a little bit of trepidation on the part of the press to publish, to take up space by a white author. But uh, one of the the biggest compliments I got was from a, a friend of mine who said, the book, it offers scenarios, it shows your life, but it doesn't tell the reader what to do or what to think. It just sort of, she said, it's much like the elders telling stories. They don't offer direction. They just lay the story out and it's up to the reader to, to go with what their heart tells them to do. So I was very moved by that. I was very, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to an elder, at all but I am saying that nobody wants to be told what to do nobody wants right. to say you know examine your life and you know like take take account culpability all that stuff there was some they wanted to call this um tracking the caribou queen semicolon colonial culpability and I just thought you know I think that's a little bit too damning like heavy-handed yeah it's heavy-handed why don't we just lay it out as it is and see if 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 people can learn something just by reading uh, an honest account of growing up blinded and kind of coming to some some understanding i was a participant active participant in the colonial society that i grew up in but you can't begin to right a wrong unless you recognize the wrong and unless you recognize your part in uh, perpetuating that wrong and then you can become a true ally that's right and then you can start to advocate and really work not overtaking the voice but elevating elevating Ele the yes. voice you know yes. of of indigenous people Margaret, That's you've been very generous with your time. One more question, one more quick question. What are you working on now? What can we expect to see with your byline on it next? Oh, I have a really fun collection. Um, it's called, C the book is, the working title is Seen From Away, and it's a collection of 18 linked short stories. The first seven are take place in Europe. So they are, and people behaving badly. And then the same characters are reintroduced as younger characters. And you start to understand the motive and psychology of their bad behavior. But it's this, no, this idea that I'm playing with that, you know, when you're traveling, everything is heightened and everything feels like completely new and stuff like that. You can, you can sort of see yourself better, more clearly when you're out of your milieu, you're in a different place. So all these these characters gather in France. I, I've got a bit of an obsession with France and I've lived there. Um, last time I was there, I, I did a house exchange and I stayed for seven months, which was wonderful, right? In rural France. And so I have this collection of short stories which shows characters, but then we get to meet their younger selves and we understand in a secondary story, and sometimes it comes much later in the collection, we understand, we re-meet the character's younger self, and it kind of sheds light on the current behavior. So it is a collection of short fiction. I'm shopping it right now. 
so I've got four stories out and I'm trying to find an Ontario publisher for that. I don't have, um, I haven't had any bites yet, but I just sent the, the manuscript out. I have 18 of these stories. I think they really illustrate sort of an uh, expat community, but also again, how we need to understand our younger selves before we can really know where we're at and how our past sheds light on our present, which I think is also the work of the memoir. In a way, I feel like in tracking the Caribou Queen, the act of memoir is, is going back to that very confused young girl who was Margie and rescuing her. And I guess because I'm in the third act of my life, I'm spending a lot of my time reflecting and uh, thinking about um, the past and how it informs the present and how that can inform the future. It sounds fantastic. I love short story cycles or linked short stories. So um, that's great. I would like to pre-book you to come back on and talk about that book when it's when it comes out. Margaret, thank you so much for coming on and telling us about all this good stuff, all this great writing you're doing. And oh. I just hope people will go out and pick up Tracking the Caribou Queen as soon as possible. Well, thank you, Sean. It was really great to talk to you in this format. Fantastic. Thank you.